I'm going to jump in and introduce the handsome bald guy who's just been talking to you, who is John Anderson, who I've known. I'm First of all, I'm Frank Starkey. Uh, um, that's my name. Um, I'm not introducing myself. I'm introducing John, who I've known through the Seaside Institute from going back to the mid-'90s. Uh, John is a – when I, at the time I first met him, he was a recovering electrician um, or electrical engineer or electrical contractor or something. He did wires. Um, then he became a builder. Um, he's kind of been a, uh, I think, raconteur is his – is that your, yeah, that's your term for yourself? Um, he's uh, been involved with a fabulous project in Chico, California called Doe Mill, another one called Miriam Park, and is now on to um, smaller and better things, uh, as all of us are. And so I'll um, uh, let John take it away from here. He's also going to introduce Richard Hunt, who's our other speaker, um, when it comes time to pass the baton. So thank you all for coming. I know you all could have been um, listening to uh, some esoterica from, from Andres or some um, policy wonkiness from Lee Sobel, so we're glad you're here for actually producing something. So uh, thanks for joining us. Hopefully. Well, I, and thank you for that touching and compelling introduction, Frank. The, uh, 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 Frank is a very nervy person who decided that the best use of his architectural degree would be to become a developer. Um, the, uh, so you can talk to him after the session about how that's gone for him and, and uh, uh, the interesting uh, path of self-discovery he's had uh, low these many years. Um, also in the audience, I, I see uh, Ward Davis. Ward, see a lot of the nice people? Ward's a recovering investment banker uh, who's a developer. So you can see the panoply of wise choices that are available to this. You know, we, we, people leave perfectly good professions to become developers for some reason. My thesis on this, why do people become developers? It's the same reason that people become, you know, professional athletes, schoolyard bullies, you know, Witches, you know, the idea that you know something somebody else doesn't. And if you don't actually know something somebody else doesn't, you take the things you do know and you hold them very close and you pretend that they have greater weight than they do, or you're so busy doing them you never fully explain them to other people. So we're going to initiate you into the dark arts of the, of the development pro forma. Now, um, as we saw this, this, uh, this thing in half, uh, I'm going to write here is, is Richard Hunt uh, from Peloton Research. Richard's uh, an appraiser, quant analyst, market guy. Um, he's a, he has a tremendous gift for understanding data and then stumbling through his first two attempts of explaining it to you because there's so much important stuff there. So um, we have real grown-ups here in addition to myself um, and, and Richard is one of those grown-ups and he's going to talk about uh, some of the more nuanced stuff. Uh, I'm going to talk about kind of the blood and guts stuff. You absolutely have to have cold before you can get into the conversation with people that you're trying to explain how your building will make money. So, the uh, oh, let's pass these out too. Um, these are two separate things. My lovely assistant. Uh, thank you, Vanna. Um, What's coming around is a uh, uh, something that we would like our firm would like to take complete credit for because we can't remember who we stole the idea from. Um, a plan, an elevation, and a pro forma in analytique. So for you architects, you know, here we go, all together on one sheet so you can understand it all at once. So we're going to use a very simple building and a very simple pro forma to walk through this stuff. So the. Uh, now, if you quick quick survey, uh, how many folks are taking this as kind of a leisure tour of something they really really know all, really well t already? You know, kind of the okay, Ward. Okay, a couple of folks. If you're new to this, you know, we're going to give you those powerful tools you need for everyday accomplishment, like three-letter acronyms and slang. You know, go. So watch out for those. But we're also giving you, with this thing that's coming around, you get the live file that you can, uh, you can play with and you can uh, massage, you can make things, you can do things to your project, add units, add costs, reduce returns. And you can see what happens when you poke at a building, which is basically what somebody does with a pro forma. It's sketching with the spreadsheet. 
And it's something you do in the privacy of your own office, your own backyard, uh, and you don't show it to anybody else until you really have it dialed in and figured out. So the idea that you're practicing on your own, you don't have to worry about other people seeing this thing, and then now you've developed a network with other folks who are, are having the same experiment. So performance for the rest of us, or uh, I think Richard called it performance for the 99%. Yes. Yeah. Okay. See, the other guys have theirs. Okay, so I'm in Chico, California, where we have wonderful old buildings built by the lost race. Oh, this is great. This is excellent. Imagine, in your mind's eye, I'm seeing, let's see, it's CNU 21, we're in Salt Lake, and I have an overwhelming number of requests that I should present with other people because I will make them look so good <laughs> after the pro forma lecture that we heard so much about in West Palm. Okay, you got it? Okay, this could be good. Um, so you have your hard costs, which are your bricks and sticks, okay? And you have your land, which you want to count separately because it can be complicated. And you have your soft costs. So you have your hard costs, your soft costs, your land, what it costs you to get started. Then you're gonna have the things that you will charge money for, the things you're renting the building for, your, your revenue. So you tally up what are you going to charge for the, you know, the various uh, size apartments, um, and you subtract out a uh, vacancy factor. The, a bank that you're seeking a loan for, uh, you could show them that this is going to be rented all the time to people that are in your immediate family, and they will still make you put in a 5% vacancy factor. You can show them a history of, you know, it's never had less than, you know, it's only been, it only stays vacant long enough for me to clean the bathroom and rent it out again. They'll... 5% vacancy factors, that, all, that always goes in. And then you have your operating costs, your, project, your uh, property management, your real estate taxes, your trash, you know, the things that it costs you every month to run the thing. Whoa, we're back up. Oh, and you want it focused yeah, back too, okay. <laughs> somebody focus. No, really, somebody focus it. <laughs> You had it a second ago. Well, okay. So we'll have a great story at the end of all this, right? Okay, so, and this is the sort of stuff we ended up building for sale, you know, until the bottom dropped out, and then we started thinking about it in these terms. Now, this high production value diagram, Venn diagram. Um, we've been working with this since uh, 2011, so haven't changed it since. The wonderful rich palette of urbanism available to thoughtful people in 2011. Okay, over here on the other side, a slightly smaller circle, financing available in 2011. And this intersection is actually exaggerated by a factor of 10, uh, the stuff we'll be building for the next 10 years. So. The idea that we need to be really smart about how we're going to build, we have to know the numbers cold uh, because there's a lot of conversation that needs to happen to be able to get to a successful project. So the you know, land development 101, if you control one of these things, you have the land that's in your family. Um, um, you're dating the woman who has the land. The, uh, you understand the entitlement process and have been very successful in that town. You, you have capital you'd like to invest. Um, you control the tenant, you know, say you, you know that uh, a coffee store wants to be on one of two locations and you've arranged a, a brokerage uh, commission to get them landed there. If you control one of these things, that's your minimum entry into I, I can build something and rent it to someone. If you control more than one of those things, your chances go up. If you control three of those things, now it's looking like this is actually your trade. You're actually your developer. Uh, so the, how many folks are design professionals or planners? Job market is tough out there, I tell you. Um, how many of those folks think that, that developers and builders make huge piles of money when they apply their trade? It was kind of a loaded question, I'm sorry. The, uh, um, well, I'm here to tell you that um, most deals are predictably thin and only improved by hard work, paying attention, 
some luck and making good relationships and communicating well with people and paying people on time. Um, on the left side, see the building thing where what goes into, for a production builder, what goes into the house that you sell for, say, $200,000. Um, the top two things, the finished lot's about 20% of that price. So 40 grand for the lot. Uh, direct construction costs, bricks and sticks, you know, subcontracts for plumbing, et cetera, 50% of the sale price. So $100,000 for direct construction costs. Those two things together, uh, should really never be more than 70% of what you're charging for the house, the lot and the bricks and sticks. Because you need the rest to be able to manage, you know, improving the lot and building it and selling it, sales commissions, uh, insurance, overhead, portage ons profit, okay? Indirect construction, supervision, portage ons uh, ladder rental, you know, uh, erosion control, you know, insurance, back office. That'll and uh, sales, uh, construction interest, uh, that's all in the 18%, and that's to get you to a 10% profit with 2% can go wrong. So this ratio, think about what you charge, what someone's charging to sell a house, say $200,000. They're probably making 20 grand on that house if they are at the absolute elite top of their class. Lots of builders make two or 3%. $200,000 house, Six grand. Okay. Would you go through all the brain damage of trying to find sober drywallers for six grand? You know, how much time do you want to spend? You know, in the marshalling of dyslexic parolees, you know, to sell a two hundred thousand dollar house. You know, uh, a lot of large production house home builders, big nationals, made very good money by by controlling land positions. Now, land position is not the same thing as land. Land position says, you know, Mike Watkins is obligated to sell me uh, 150 finished lots at this price today, regardless what houses are being sold for in two years. And I'm going to make money on the arbitrage between what Mike was foolish enough to commit to me, because I'm a big builder, and what I can sell them to the end user at the other end. So, you know, I, can, the, so I could end up paying only 10% of the sales price of the house for the lot by the time I get halfway through the the, the uh, lots that Mike was silly enough to sell to me. Um, so big builders typically have made a lot of money in the, in the arbitrage between what's going on now and what's likely to go on without the obligation. You know, they haven't actually signed a contract to buy it. They have a contract that they can buy it. Uh, and those, those land positions show up on their balance sheet on Wall Street, and that's why people still pay for their stock. Okay. The other side of it, again, so... That's a production builder making 10% on a, in a great year, okay? Um, most folks are, you know, that are in home building now that still actually have a home building company are essentially working for wages. You know, the ability to just keep their crews together enough, they're remodeling, they're, they're struggling all over the place. The other side, the land development people, those are really kind of sleazy individuals that somehow through moving imaginary lines on paper and schmoozing with planning commissioners make huge piles of money, right? Any land develop any scurrilous land developers in the audience? Yes, I see you out there. Well, these fellows, they scurry out into the light, they get their deal done, they disappear, they don't actually have to build stuff, right? You know. But in order to sell somebody the finished lot, you know, the sale their, the finished lot sale is their goal. They're trying to get there. So the 100% of what it takes to, what your price is for the finished lot, you should be making about 30% of that as your profit because you have pretty significant risk. It might take a while to get it done. If you don't get your entitlements in time to put the improvements in the ground before the winter, you're carrying that land till the spring and may, you know, and then you lost your excavator and your utility contractor. You may, you may miss another season. So there's a lot of risk associated with the entitlement and the installation of, of infrastructure, with the management of the design, engineering, and entitlements, particularly if you're going to do any of that urbanism stuff, because that could take a while. And then you need to allow for sales and marketing and overhead. You know. uh, and at the bottom, can you, can you see that, the land residual? Residual, like when you boil off all the good stuff. This is the gunk left at, you know, the, at, the, at the bottom of the pot, right? This is what we're, we have left over to actually pay the landowner. So someone who has land is going to be developed, he's going to make a killing. 
he's going to make 15% of the sale price of the lot, which is only 20% of the sale price of the house. So you see how this changed together? So this is like your basic developer production builder math. So, um, so this should probably, um, if this hasn't convinced you not to go into the land development and home building business at this time, please see me afterwards and I'll repeat it again. Okay. Now, so here's the typical arrangement for land development, for home building, for uh, building rental apartments, mixed use buildings, whatever. You typically, you know, when you say the developer, that's the guy who showed up at the public meeting, you know, and looked a little apologetic and tried to make the case for why it would be good to have civilization here, you know. The developer, it's actually a combination usually. Often there's a capital partner, someone who's put up cash, who's providing capital that helps make things go. And then there's the operating partner. Capital partner puts up cash, gets the cash back, and then a return. Operating partner does the legwork, talks to the planning commissioner, make sure the engineer's work is in on time, make sure fees are paid, make sure that they're actually, they run a survey and they're actually working on the right property. Gets insurance to make sure that that happened. Typically, you're providing your know-how, your relationships, uh, your reputation, that you've done good work before. Uh, you get a fee. So someone else puts up the cash to make it all work. You get a fee and you work hard as a fee developer. So at the end of the day, when, when money is made above and beyond the cost, you pay a rich, first thing that happens is you pay a return to the capital partner. You pay your money partner back. You know, he gets his cash back and he gets a return. Um, you pay a fee to the operating partner, the guy who ran around like crazy. At that point, you're probably settling up on a draw that he was getting for, it's been 18 months since we started this project. So he may be drawing against that fee to feed his family and send his kids to college, you know, pay his bills, but he isn't really making anything beyond kind of having a job at that point. And then you divide the remaining in what's called a waterfall. And it's called a waterfall because at the front end, the capital partner is typically getting 90% of the money coming off it. And then as you move forward in time, it flips, and then the operating partner gets more revenue. The idea is that you pay for capital the way you pay for plywood or concrete. It's a commodity necessary to build. Uh, and there are certain things that come into the play when you ask someone to use their money for a while. What's the risk of me never getting this money back? If you tell them really freaking high, then they say, well, um, I've always liked you, but I, I have another deal I could do where the risk of me meeting, not getting my money back is not so high, so I think I'll do that one instead. Unless you wanted to pay me a return that was really freaking high, too. So there's a relationship between the risk and the benefit you're going to see on the other side by letting somebody use their money. So here we go. Imagine these are numbers you could see. Um, <laughs> So follow along in your hymnals. Up here, uh, land cost, city fees and permits. That's, in your so that's part of your soft cost. But it's very helpful to identify it separately because often uh, there's a huge variance from one city to the next. You cross an imaginary boundary of cities. Uh, uh, the city fees can go up a lot, you know, significantly. Uh, in, if you look at the, um, I think if you look at the performer, I can't quite see it here. Uh, city you know, land cost is 10% of this deal, 10% of the total project cost. City fees, yeah, it's 12%. So in many cases, particularly in California, thank you very much, uh, city fees are going to be more than the land uh, because you're paying for traffic and schools and lots of other stuff, lots of impact fees. Okay, your construction costs, both your direct and indirect, you get and that all that stuff up there gets you to your total project cost. And then here are uh, your, your rents. You have a monthly carried out to the annualized, you know, how much are we making every year on each apartment? Uh, and then so you have your annualized rents, less your vacancy, you have your operating cost. And here's an important little piece of math that uh, will get you a really nifty three-letter acronym, okay? Your net operating income is your rent minus your operating expenses. Now, everybody say it with me, NOI. NOI. It has to be casual. It's like you've been saying it your whole life, you know. NOI. Well, you know, our NOI on this is this. So the jargon, acronym and stuff, that's important stuff. 
So, because it, it demonstrates that you have some basic facility with the thing that people are worried about lending you money on, and they're worried about, am I going to get my money back? Uh, cap rate. Cap rate is abbreviated from capitalization rate. And you get this magic number by dividing uh, the NOI by the project cost. So you get a little percentage there. Uh, the, in lots of places where people have lots of other opportunities, um, your deal may not be as good as other deals, and this is the number they'll use to justify that decision. This is like an SAT score. You know. Now, how many people feel like uh, there was, when they got their SAT scores, there was like a mistake. I mean, that can't be the score, you know. Nobody, everybody, yeah, they, yeah, okay. I'm surely smarter than that, you know. Uh, well, your deal actually may be better than your cap rate, but, you know, without the SAT score, they won't let you into Michigan State, you know. It, they are going to use that number relative to other numbers, other people's SAT scores. So people looking at your deal compared to other deals will use this as kind of the basic barrier to entry. So if the way that your costs and your revenue and your operating expenses all track out gets to a number that's in some places south of 9%, they may not want to see your deal. This one is at 7. Now, think about who you're looking for as your investor or your lender. If it's your local bank and you've known them forever and they're going to keep this loan in their portfolio, and your brother-in-law, the orthodontist, who has an ungodly amount of money, is going to guarantee the loan. Nobody's really worried about the cap rate. They're thinking about they'll get the money from your brother-in-law. He signed the personal guarantee. So you seem like a nice fellow. They'll make you the loan. If you're doing a, a large project and you're talking to a sophisticated lender and it's all about the project, these numbers become increasingly more important. So small project. Get familiar with these things, how it works, so that you can advance to larger projects if necessary, but you can also defend your project relative to other investments. Okay, down here, the cash flow. Okay, so how much money are you borrowing? Typically, for a construction loan, people are going to be looking for, at a minimum, 80% of the cost of the project is all they want to lend you. So they want you to have a minimum of 20% of equity in it. Uh, skin in the game is a, is a nice, everybody say it's skin in the game. I've got all kinds of skin in the game. Skin in the game, yeah. You'll need to work on that confidence thing because you... Okay. Um, I've got 20% of the cost of this thing already, already hard in the ground. Hard in the ground, yes. Okay. This point where deciding how much you're going to be able to borrow or not, this will be a toggle point with the bank. We'll lend you... Uh, we really like this project. I mean, we really, and we think it's really good for the community. That corner really needs a building. We really like this project. Do we tell you we really like this project? Because, you know, that's why we're willing to lend you 60% of the cost. So now you're going to have to come up with more of a down payment, more equity. So, or you'll have to negotiate with the bank, well, what would it take? The, there's always a bad news thing from the lender. So you have to ask them, you know, well, that's interesting. Uh, the other underwriter I talked to didn't have that, wasn't of that opinion. How, how did you get to this? Oh, well, our bank is looking at this number this week, or this set of numbers, or we had some loans that look a lot like yours that we're having big trouble with, so we figured if we asked for a bigger down payment, you'd go away, and I wouldn't have to explain to our board why we didn't make this loan, since they're on the board of your nonprofit, too. So, uh, so your loan rate and debt service? What percentage interest are you going to pay for the construction loan? So there it is, annualized. Uh, and here's what happens at the end of the day. That you're paying your monthly uh, construction loan bill. The building's all, this assumes that everything happened kind of instantly. You bought the land, you got it all approved, you built the building, you got the bank loan, it sort of magically happened. Just to show how things work together. So. That's how much money is left over at the end of the day after you've paid your bank loan. Out of that money, you know, if you had to borrow money from your brother-in-law, the orthodontist, you know, uh, if he put up the entire down payment, that return on equity at the bottom, that's how much money, if you gave all the proceeds to him, that's how much he would be making on his down payment. Now, those of you that are architects and might be specking your work, your the fact that you didn't bill anybody for that counts 
You know, that's part of your equity in the project. Or maybe you own the land. The bank would like that because instead of you're borrowing money to own the land and they, they may come up short if they have to repossess it. Um, if you already own the land, you put it up as security as opposed to a set of drawings, they like that a lot better. And down at the bottom, uh, you'll see a debt service coverage ratio. Uh, and that's a very important thing for a banker. He wants to know how much money does this building make beyond what you've got to pay me. Never mind what you have to pay your brother, the orthodontist. You know, he's later. Um, I want to know that, that's, that every month you have, well, certainly 100% of the money you have to pay me. I'd feel a lot better. We like the number 1.25. We, we think that's our minimum number. Actually, we've had a rough week. Our number this week is 1.37. So this number will move around, and people will pay attention to what other banks are doing on that number as well as the interest rate. But sometimes the interest rate is much less important than the debt service coverage number. Okay? So how much cash is going to show up when people pay their rent? How much extra cash is going to be left over after you take care of all your expenses, including the bank? The, and there we go. And there's your, that's the return on equity number. So, oh, and it says return on equity number. Okay. So simple equation here. This one, uh, this is a little taxpayer building. Same issues you got. Uh, so, again, the building, the plan, the elevation, the pro forma all together. So you can talk about an entire thing all at once, you know. Not, not back and forth between the spreadsheet and the drawings and everything else. So, the, uh, so this sort of elevates... Uh, the pro forma because it's on, they'll hang on to this one because it has a pretty picture of the building. The plain spreadsheet, they might lose that one. So also it's oversized, so it's easy to find in the pile. And again, the other one, and okay. So this is the, uh, the, the actual file that you guys have. Uh, and at this point, I'll take questions about how quickly I ran through that after our strong start. So any questions so far? It's like I'm, I really want to know because if we're uh, we're running over something, you know, when you back up, you like you look like you have a question, sir. No, yeah, you. Well, it depends on uh, – cap rate is a, is a, a number that you – it's like a relative number. What other deals are they looking at? What other opportunities do they have? Um, and the, the – real estate lending kind of runs in, in clumps because the word gets out that uh, Richard's Bank is doing a lot of sub-six cap deals, you know, for some reason. And – uh, so if you've had a project you haven't been able to massage to a point where it gets above a six cap, you'll go see Richard, and they'll write, they'll write more loans. What may be happening is Richard has uh, a, a source of capital that is willing to live with that sort of return, and they're comfortable with the idea of making this loan because maybe they want to accumulate some crappy apartment buildings for some reason. So if your game plan is, I'm going to buy this building now, at a, at a four or five cap for some crazy reason. I'm going to put a bunch of my own money into it. I'm pledging some other security. I'm enhancing this loan in other ways. I'm, yes, the entree is mediocre and lame, but the appetizers I'm adding to, the, to your meal are wonderful, you know, and you're getting such good service that you're going to write this loan. So that you're, you're, you'll see subpar loans being made with other considerations. The guy writing the six cap loan may have made a compensating balance deposit, put a bunch of freaking money in their bank that he's getting next to nothing for, and they have it not only as security, they have it to play with. So compensating balances, Ward? Um, 
So if you borrow money on a project, which real estate you almost always do, um, the interest rate affects the cap rate that's acceptable pretty, pretty strongly. So a lot of times in finance, we'll talk about the cap rate spread uh, as, as, a, as a stronger anchor than just the absolute cap rate. Right now, when interest rates are extremely low, and uh, even on some deals, you can get about four and a half percent money on pretty long-term deals, the cap rate uh, uh, can be pretty low on the project. You know, if you've got an eight and a half percent cap rate, well, you've still got a four percent, four percent spread to the interest rate. Well, if the interest rate goes up two percent, we're going to to keep the cap rate spread the same. Well, the cap rate would have to go up two percent as well. So that's that's a big piece. The other big piece is uh, on cap rate is purchase versus sale. Um, if you if you're, I mean, purchase versus uh, development. If you're doing a development deal, there should be development profit in the deal, so that so that an investor or a bank is going to require a higher cap rate on a development deal. If you've got a stabilized apartment building that's been ticking along at a, a certain level, there's a lower degree of risk, and therefore you can get financing with a lower cap rate, and sometimes much lower cap rate. Um, uh, so those are those are two of the big two of the big drivers of cap rate. We should also make the distinction between. If you're looking for a construction loan on something that is very likely to be rented, there's still construction risk and leasing risk. You know, are you really going to get the rents that you say? If you have a stabilized uh, rent roll, people have been in there 10 years, no one ever leaves, they pay, everyone pays $1,000 a month, there's very low risk for the bank in that, in that case. And they send someone around to see that the building still has a roof. You know, uh, so their, their risk is less. Michael? I'm oh, sorry, no. Well, when you see them stacking up, uh, uh, permitting and impact fees in my neck of the woods are more than land. You know, um, so they're very significant. And they get adjusted uh, rather suddenly. They, they don't move a little bit. You know. If someone figures out that they're going to have to replace all the overpasses in a municipality, your impact fees just got up. You know, because they're going to bond for that, and they're going to they look to to toll it out of existing people and new construction. So it can move fast, uh, and it's, so it's important to keep track of where your local municipal budget is, so that you can see if there's going to be an increase in uh, impact fees, and stay close to your brother build, brothers and sisters in the building industry who will usually delay an impact fee increase by six months, you know, by lobbying. At which point you have a chance to get your project in. Not that that's, I've ever done that. But. Uh, you show it as rent and rent subsidy, and you and you tell them straight up what it is, um, and the. Sometimes those things have nice guarantees to them, and sometimes they have a downside because the appraiser will, uh, the, the bank's agent looking at it may treat it differently. Um, sometimes those buildings have higher vacancy rates, higher turnovers, not because of someone's in there in a Section 8. They have high turnovers because they're right next to the freeway, and as soon as people have a better offer and a place to live, they leave. So, the, so there, there are often a couple of factors that go into that. And the, the safe thing to do is to work with banks that understand that, that product type. If they, want that, if they want that loan in their portfolio to help with uh, Community Reinvestment Act uh, credit, um, they'll factor that into their underwriting. If they've never seen one like that, um, it'll go into a stack for a loan committee and not come out the other side. So the, and the, if it's also, there's a difference between portfolio loans that a local bank is holding and loans that are going to be securitized or, or shipped out somewhere else. Um, the bank, banks like to hold on to things they could move if they needed to. They would like to have a portfolio of kind of investment grade stuff they could send down the road. And in the course of doing banking business, favors will be done and the like, but um, they would still like to have something that's pretty prime in their portfolio. So, oh, Keith? Or some of the soft costs that you have to, or operating expenses. Where, where do you, 
We, we, a lot of we use a really sophisticated method of called asking around. Um, and then no, we also have Richard do it. So Yeah, no, there's, there's a lot of resources out there. Uh, CoStar uh, is probably one of the biggest for looking at comparable um, property types across, you know, the entire stream. Um, they, they actually just acquired LoopNet, which was their competitor. So now they're the biggest source. Uh, you can typically go in and, you know, whatever particular property you're looking for, you can get a profile of that property type and it'll give you the information. And you can look through and see the, the lease rates and, and the percentages for operating expenses and all that. You can analyze. And that's well, it's by it's yeah. They have they have pretty much every property transaction that occurs in the country. They try to get as many as they can. You know, they they claim it's CoStar. CoStar is a great source. C O S T A R, and it's www.costar.com. Um, also, Price Waterhouse um, does a lot of this this type of uh, information, and uh, a group called Corpaz, which I think actually Price Waterhouse owns now, but they do all of the um, the cap rate. Uh, analysis, you, you can find cap rates for all the various product types uh, in the country, and that's Corpaz, K-O-R-P-A-C-Z. I think that's great. Um, and then, of course, the Multifamily Housing Council, they, yeah. have, they have information for spe specifically for multifamily housing. So. Um, some of some of the information they provide is free, but that, tip that information is typically has a lag time, so you typically have to pay a little bit of money. It's really worth it if you're doing a, a project to spend 30 or $40, like CoStar is about $40 per profile. Um, if, so if you're gonna get into this, it's good to um, uh, have your appraiser over for dinner on a regular basis, bring them gifts. Uh, yeah, definitely. Cultivate a relationship with an appraiser. I'm serious, the, that- He has done this, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Cultivate a relationship with an appraiser so that he can translate the basic thing you want to do, I want to build this seven unit building, I want to charge this much for rent, I'm, I'm you know, my bids are in, I'm, you know, this is happening, you know, and, and then Richard will tell you, well, dude, you know, uh, CoStar says, you know. Yeah. So the... Uh, or our local, by the way, our local, you know, whatever your local comparable transactions are, you can glean from that information, yeah. whatever you need, and, and make those calculations. And, and in this scenario, you know, in Chico, we may not, ha we may not have a comparable, yeah. you know, of this type, so we have and to go th search. That it. actually brings up a very important point. If you're building amazing small-scale buildings that are well amenitized right on the edge of downtown and, you know, 200 feet from $3 coffee, there may not be a piece of new construction in recent memory that is comparable. At which point you start to, you know, try to come up with a rationale that the appraiser could use. And you're going to take a flyer and you're going to say, you know, I bet you I could get $1,000 for that little one bedroom. And the banker, you know, will tell you his opinion and it may not match yours. So until, so it's, that's why it's good to get uh, the early gruesome struggle of a, of a small project out of the way that gets you higher rents that now you can refer to with a later project. But the idea that there's a nice, steady, clear path in the market, that rents for one-bedroom apartments near $3 coffee are always $1.35 a square foot, that may not be available to you, and you may have to take some risk. And you may not get the money you want based on what you think the rents are going to be because they, you can't prove it. People can ask anecdotally, you can put up a, you can get a, I have a list of seven people who want to live next to $3 coffee from Craigslist. There's still going to be an underwriting standard you're going to have to meet. Uh, yeah, there's a couple of points you're just making, kind of going towards my question. Um, you, know, you have to prove it, you know, the basis of estimate. When you go to the bank and look for money, my experience is you have to prove that you don't need the money in order to get it, generally speaking. Uh, and I deal a lot with federal contracting, and uh, in a fixed price environment, they don't really look at you too much because the risk and the burden and the cost of realism is on you, the bidder, which is kind of the case here with you the bank. Well, the, no, they, it, it's a, actually a simpler process than federal contracting. The, uh, uh, but the, 
Well, unless, it, unless it's HUD. It's, unless it's HUD, yeah. yes. Uh, if it's just straight up mortgage, um, the, you need to provide kind of reasonable documentation that will be examined by an appraiser that they will hire. And sometimes they're hiring. No, but it's somebody who knows them. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, you know, the appraisers as a group, um, you may remember them from junior high. They were the skinny kids who were shoved into the locker. They grew up to become appraisers. <laughs> the, um, so there's a lot of self-esteem issues, and they tend to sort of hang together as a group. You know, the nerdy kids in the back of the gym. You know, so they all know each other. You know, and they're all competing with each other, but still need information from each other. So there's kind of a tenuous, you know, and they play, there's some favoritism and the like. And the local appraisers will typically hang together against the folks that are being brought in from out of the area. So they look to establish the idea that, look, our local banks should hire local guys who know stuff, as opposed to some Yahoo from, you know, down the interstate. So they know each Yes. Yes. Yes, they, they have a, a standard of care like accountants are supposed to be held to or lawyers or, or doctors or architects. So they, they, are, they have certification that says, I know the right way to account for the value of something. So your application comes in, along with your appraisal, you check for the appraisal. It goes to the appraiser. He looks at the documentation and, and often arrives at a value using your information but also more information that he gathered. Now, if your information is very well organized and very clear, and somehow you had help from your friend the appraiser about how to organize this information to be reviewed by another appraiser, your chances of actually getting a good appraisal are very good. Um, if you have your stuff together as best you can, the way you read about it in the book, you know, you, you know it's kind of a crapshoot. So I would recommend not only um, uh, be, be developing a sincere and genuine friendship with your appraiser, uh, but also understanding the world from his lens. What's a good way to find properties? Would you just go to a broker or would you, uh, uh, maybe there's some networking groups you recommend? Well, the, a really great way to find properties is to go to like a mid-level, like Planner 2, uh, you know, that works for the city. Uh, and you need a, probably an introduction from your friend, the appraiser. You need a warm introduction. And you talk to this guy who is now about 12 to 15 years out of school and is realizing the difficult circumstance his city is in. At the, you, know, you just can't get good projects anymore. Things are really grim. You know, boy, you know, if somebody would just put in, you know, a mixed-use building on the corner of, of Thomas and what, such and such street, that would just be so amazing, you know. And we just upzone that property. I don't know why they don't do that. So the world of developers, because they're sufficiently scary and difficult people to deal with and are often yelling at them across the counter in the planning department, become they. So you can be him. I don't know why he doesn't do that. You know, I'm going to call him up. You know, they just upzone the corner of Thomas and what's it? You know, you shouldn't look at that property because, you know, uh, she's had it since her husband died like 10 years ago. You should talk to Mrs. Johnson, you know. So there are people who have a vested interest in something getting built, and they, don't only have, they not only have a vested interest, they're completely pissed off that it's not happening yet. Because it's a mystery to them, you know, why people build where they build. So go find the discontented people inside the city government. Or uh, better yet, if your city is uh, annexing property that used to be in the county and connecting sewers and things like that, Find the guy who's the mid-level 12 to 15 year mid-career, I'm not so excited about working for the city anymore, sanitation engineer, the guy who's doing the sewer project, and learn all about where the sewer is going. Because, you know, if it's not there and you want the property, you're going to have to bring it there. But if the city's bringing it there for other reasons or running right past it to go to the new high school, then the guy who is installing the sewer and knows, like, to the month, when that vacant parcel on Thomas and What's It is going to have sewer, that's a good guy to know too. Brokers are like the last people I want to talk to about buying real estate. Because they, they just have what they have. And they need to tell you a good story about why you should buy it. So, the, the, so truth and, and, and advantage become kind of relative things. This is the least crappy piece of property I can represent to you with a straight face. It's going to be amazing.
planning and political environment of the municipality you're talking to if you're going to propose to do something like these crazy people at this conference or this Congress are talking about. Um, you want to make sure that you've got the cover um, to get the entitlements to do something that might be outside the boundary of what they're used to doing, or if, they, if there are places progressive enough to have form-based codes or, or ordinances in place to, to facilitate this kind of stuff, make sure that, that that stuff, um, that you're going to be able to do what you want to do and, and walk away quickly and find other municipalities if you find the instant that you find that it's going to be too hard to, to get approvals, because there's just there's too many other opportunities. Yeah, the if once you start looking, it's a little bit like heightened awareness. You buy a Prius, you see them everywhere. You know, um, once you start understanding, uh, that's a piece of property that could have an apartment building on it, or an office building on it, or both. You'll start to see them everywhere. You know, also once you understand kind of how flexible, you know, good. Uh, urban building types are, and you get a uh, kind of a, a radar that's tuned to, oh, this is a 100-foot lot? Wow. They want how much for this? That's great. Oh, we should definitely talk to them. Uh, one of the other things you may want to look at is um, land that comes to you through uh, relationships, family, etc., often has a lot of hair on it. Um, sorry. Land that comes to you through family often has complicating factors that maybe make your project difficult. This deal has a lot of hair on it. But actually, that will help you in talking to other professionals, but not so much to your family. Um, <laughs> so be mindful about uh, land that comes in, you know, with family strings to it. Because uh, people, other people's expectation, remember that the thing about how much are you going to make when you build a house? You know, uh, a family member's expectation about how much you will make through fiddling with real estate is typically astronomically out of all reality. Um, and if there's some bad blood in your family already, you can make it much worse. So, um, One of the other places to, to look for real estate is with your title company. Uh, they're really nice people that will come to the counter and answer all your questions in the hope that someday you'll buy title insurance from them. And they have all kinds of maps and all kinds of information. And that's also a place where you can see that that's why that building seems to be in trouble. There are 47 liens on it. There are people who have filed claims against this building when it sells. You know, um, so there's a lot of information available at the title company. Uh, with uh, things like Bing and Google Earth and the like, you can and you can start uh, kind of tagging physical pieces of property on your computer that say, okay, this is what I learned about this parcel. You know. This is what I learned about that parcel. I heard this one sold for this. So you can end up with your own little, uh, you know, collection of post-it notes, a little better organized on the computer. Bruce, um, I want to put in a plug for um, local development corporations. They can do a lot mm -hmm. of the When I worked for one, we did this all the time. I mean, I didn't do all of it, but many of us worked on it. And they'll also tell you how banks are doing this under the CRA. So you can say. To, to restate that, local development corporations, community development corporations, CDCs, uh, neighborhood housing services, the nonprofits that are <coughs> developing in your town. The gestation period on their deals is often years. So they know what's going on on the properties they can't deal with. Um, they also know people who wouldn't sell to them but pledged that they would sell the first private person to knock on their door. So there's, there's a lot of good intel that's available there. Uh, CRA is Community Reinvestment Act. It's a federal law that says that if you take deposits in a certain area, you can't deny people loans in that area. Um, so that's one of the things the regulators look at. Uh, very large banks typically have large programs in place. Very small banks are usually overlooked for a couple of years when they get started, but after a while are now, in the, are now have to come into compliance. And medium-sized regional banks are always screwing this up. They're, 
because they pass the CRA, you know, responsibility, you know, okay, it's your turn. You need to be the CRA officer this year. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I didn't quite get these deals done, by the way. You know, it wasn't really a priority. And it might not be a priority for him. So three or four quarters down the road, they've got a problem, and now they're ready to underwrite a loan that they might not be willing to. It's always relative to other things they could do. So uh, working through this, um, I'm going to talk about some of the other considerations that you will see, and then we'll, we'll do the table exercise for which we have no table. How many people have computers and have this stuff loaded up? Okay, so this is going to be tough. I think we, we might have to huddle around. Because uh, um, what we're going to do is we're going to poke at the costs and the, and the revenues and see what happens to it and get confident with the idea that you could do this. You could understand whether or not this building will make money or lose money. So, but stepping forward, uh, so this is what we call a static pro forma. Uh, that's a much fancier term than uh, swag. <laughs> Silly, wild ass guess. Or uh, back of the envelope. Some people actually use the term BOE. You know, oh, the BOE analysis of this is, you know, it sounds like you, it, you went to NASA and got it, but you know, the, the BOE. Yeah. The back of the envelope. The idea is on the way back from seeing the property, on the back of an envelope, you said, well, if a guy paid about this much for the land and it cost about this much to build and I paid about this much in city impact fees again and um, the soft costs that say that, you know, that's this number. And then if I could rent it for that number, you know, this might work. That's all you're looking for at that point. Back of the envelope gets you to no freaking way or this might work. And since we all tend to be a bit more optimistic about how things are going to turn out, that's why we go to more and more detail. So you get out the spreadsheet, you plug in your costs, costs plug in your rents, take out your vacancy, and see how it works toward the end of it here. Uh, now on the other side here, we got a little multi-year thing that that instead of it happens magically all at once, I keep trying to find a deal I can do that actually works like that, where you know, we just figure it out and it's done. So we figured it out and it's done, works fine. But it actually takes us some time to build and some time to lease up and we get some vacancy back and forth and have to do some repairs and stuff. Over time, you know, how did the expenses play out over time? How did the revenue play out over time? What are the returns over time? If we make this money instantly, you know, then you know, it's, that's easy math. When we have to spread it over time, it gets a little more complicated. So here, okay, so. We skip that for now. We will skip this yeah. for now, and uh, we'll let Richard talk about it. Yeah. The, um, um, actually, I'm gonna roll through this anyway. The, just because I have very few opportunities to contradict Richard, so. Um, so if it's happening in year zero, your return on, you know, if you put in where it says minus 100, you, know, you put in $100,000, you made $140,000, you made a 40% return on your equity. You put in 100,000 in cash, you got back $140,000. So you got 40% return on equity. And since it happened in instantly, you also, you know, so this is always constant. You know, no matter how long it, the project takes, your return on equity for the amount of money coming back is the same math. However, your internal rate of return uh, varies. It's not always constant. So if it happens instantly, yeah, your internal rate of return is 40% same as return on equity. If it takes you a little longer, the IRR, the internal rate of return, will decrease the longer the deal takes. So the internal rate of return is something you're going to look at for how long projects take and evaluate the difference between one approach to a project and another approach or between two projects. And it's a metric that other people use for lots of different reasons, which, which we'll talk about later. So, uh, okay, who's got their computers up? Okay, the, uh, you guys buddy up. You know, the, uh, those of you who didn't bring your computers to class, you need to get the thing. Where'd it go? Which one? The, the the jump drive? Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Sure. Yeah, we can. I don't think we can read it, though. Focus it out. I don't 
don't know because we couldn't focus it probably. He went away. Can you blame him? Where is it? And ignore links. Okay, one more appeal. Did the tech guy show back up and, and, and was he feeling too shy about focusing? You know, someone try to focus, so I don't think we can be any worse. I'm going to drag the table forward or back, see if that works. Okay. Yeah, try to move the table and see if you can drop a thing on the floor. Where are you? Better? All right. The, um, this is going to be an entirely Zen experience where I tell you what numbers are and what they do, and you, in your mind's eye, you'll imagine a spreadsheet actually functioning. Or you'll find a neighbor with a computer, and that'll be easier for you. Okay, so um, let's go up to the land cost. Uh, the yellow fields are inputs. Uh, the uh, should be the static, uh, static and IRR. Everybody on it? Yeah. Can you see what's at the very Static and NOI, uh, static and IRR. Should be just one Excel file. The others, I think, are PDFs. Yeah, just fire up the Excel file. Okay, so the yellow fields are inputs, information you're providing. The, the tan fields are outputs. What happens after you put in that garbage number in the yellow field? I'm sorry, what happens when you put in that number that affected your livelihood? So, the... Uh, so we've got land costs there. Uh, we know how big the land is, and the reason why we make the square foot number a variable is we, w we know how big the land is. We don't know how much we're paying for it, and we say, what happens if we paid uh, $10 a square foot? Yeah. And what that, what, at that point, you can see what happens. Uh, you pay a little bit more. Uh, this, that one dropped the, uh, the cap rate. Uh, in a pretty, I think we will, like, went down uh, not even a quarter of a point. So you can see that the, if you, wait a minute. I entered the wrong field. Okay, 10 bucks. And you can see that, oh, great. <laughs> can you just, can you just back down, you know what? Undo. Undo, okay. undo, whatever. Back where you were. Oh, it's dying. Yeah. I hope that I can get your nomination for uh, the most technically adequate performance. I think that they're voting on that on Saturday. There's, yeah, there's a guy who needs an email. Yeah. I don't know because I can't see it. But the there, there should just be uh, one uh, point where uh, it's it's, tab it's tabulating how big the land is and it's, and it's multiplying it. So there's two yellow cells. 
One should be the one you change. Okay. Anybody still need it? Okay. All right. Put it on. Here we go. Ah, I'm dying here. Uh, oh, one of the things that, that people asked all at once, that was like, where do you find land and where do you get the information on rents and stuff, but where do you get information on a cost per square foot? Uh, typically, along with your appraiser and the, the guy who was in the planning department and all the other people that you're pumping for information, there's the guy you went to high school with who's now a very successful contractor um, and wants nothing more than to show off how much he knows about how, things, how much things cost or something to that effect. So you, you want to be able to cultivate those folks, and they will give you information on the understanding that they're likely to get the work if things can be negotiated carefully. No. NNN, net, net, net. It means triple net. Uh, that means that that is rent that, uh, well, like when you, pay, when you pay rent on the apartment, you're probably paying your own utilities. So that's the rent with, uh, with net utilities. Uh, triple net, when you pay rent in an apartment, you're probably, you're not paying your taxes and insurance separately. So the three things that become either netted or not, gross rent is everything's in. You pay $100, you get to use the, you get to use the apartment. Uh, net rent is you're paying something for rent, and then you're paying an additional charge for real estate taxes, for insurance, uh, and for utilities. So triple net space, commercial space, is often rented at a base number, say a dollar a square foot or $12 a year. And then all the charges that come from the utility company go to you. Your share of the real estate taxes go to you. Your share of the insurance and the operation of the building go to you, typically on a pro rata basis, how much of the building you have. So. Right. What, what, what's going to happen is uh, the developer uh, needs to look at what the – it's up here if anybody else needs it. Uh, the developer is looking at what the way that the local market looks at rents. And if you're in a market that does gross rents everywhere, and if you tried to talk to somebody about a triple net lease, you'd have problems. Your, number, your numbers can't be triple net numbers. They need to be um, – what's happening on the uh, – on, on the pro forma where it shows the apartments showing one type of rent and then square footage numbers for, for that are triple net is that, yeah, you're passing taxes and insurance and stuff on to that, that tenant and you're trying to come up with a number that works for that. So you need to figure out are you charging gross rent or net rent. So the typically residential apartments, the only thing that's net is utilities. You're providing water, or you're providing, you're paying all the property taxes and all the insurance and you're sweeping up the, car, the sidewalk. We're back up. And I can see it. This, thank you. Yay. Yeah. Okay. Yes, Laura. Okay. Oh, look at that. Whoa. I feel so accomplished, I got to tell you. Okay, how many advanced degrees to actually run PowerPoint? Yeah. Okay, so see these yellow cells here for uh, uh, your construction costs? Uh, see how it's almost 70% of your project costs? Um, the, you could fool yourself and say it's only going to cost you $68 per square foot to build this thing. And then you go down and you look at, oh my God, look at that. Our cap rate went up. 
you know, our returns. This is fantastic. You know, let's, let's make sure we can build this for $65 a foot. If we tell ourselves that often enough, do you think that would work? You know? So you, you end up with that budget in your mind, and then you get the prices, and it's $90 a foot, and now you've got to explain to your investor how bad things are and how you need more money. And so having a realistic idea about the cost is going to be important. So, the, uh, so to figure out just how important, uh, plug a few numbers into your cost per square foot and see what happens to the rest of your spreadsheet. What was that? Uh, well, if you've been at this a while, you'll take your most recent experience and you'll check CoStar because you know the appraiser is going to look at it. But you'll tend to trust your, you know, if you're, you're off by 10 or 20 percent, that may be a function of your, your very specific local situation. Um, and the, when you look at the transactions that are on CoStar, you need to be able to, under, to explain. If there's a spread, you need to be able to explain why there's a spread. Yeah, well, that building, you know, doesn't have an elevator and mine does, you know. Or that building has an elevator and mine doesn't, you know. Uh, and they get free garbage or, you know, you need to be able to understand where all the numbers are. So the idea that you're accountable for all the numbers and somebody's going to audit you and the like, um, there are two consequences to this sort of arrangement. One is, are you going to make money for yourself and your partners or not? And the other is, are you going to knowingly commit fraud? which would be bad <laughs> because you might be making money, but you may have borrowed money under false pretenses, which people tend to frown upon. Um, so the, the, so the, the easiest thing to do to keep your story straight is to basically just have one story, to really know your numbers, really know your, comp your competition's numbers, and understand where the risks are really, and to be willing to walk away from deals that you've invested lots of time and attention to. The, uh, uh, you know, there, there are kind of two types of developers, the, the ones who have fallen in love with the project and the ones who will, you know, um, and the ones who have fallen in love with the project and come off the other side of that, you know, that unrequited relationship uh, will tell you, yes, I was not thinking clearly. I don't know what I was thinking. I thought we could get it for 65 bucks a foot because it was a great project at 65 bucks a foot which I could never get, you know. So, so it's, if you start chasing unicorns or inventing things beyond all reality, um, finding precision in a spreadsheet is a dangerous thing. You can, you can talk yourself into a lot to three decimal places. You can actually talk a bank into something with three decimal places. You can sometimes talk an appraiser who is accountable to the bank to three decimal places. Um, but in the end, to really be sober about this stuff is very important. There are other people who invent costs for your project out of thin air. But isn't it um, also a question of where you put the cost and which part of the equation that you're, you're shoving certain things? For example, let's say you have a piece of land and the title isn't to it, okay? And if you, like, where do you put that? Do you put that in the land cost or is that in an indirect cost? Because then it gets, through the equation, it, it ends up in different places. And if it takes, you know, especially over time, 
Um, yes, but the, the straight up stuff about is this lamb or beef, you know, clear title or clouded title. You know, you, you, you need to know what you're starting with. So as you identify your line items, your ingredients that are going to go into this particular stew, you want to be clear about it. You know, that, that I'm, going to, I'm going to make sure the land has clear title. You, know, you, you have your checklist, which is much, you know, a good checklist of things that you want to make sure you're looking at is going to be much bigger than the way you summarize that information in the pro forma, back of the envelope. On the back of the envelope, uh, if you've heard a rumor that there might have been an underground tank, um, the usual thing to do with the back of the envelope is to crumple it and throw it away. You know, it's like, you, no, I'm not doing that. Um, I heard there was an underground tank. I heard there was a cleanup. Well, yeah, you go down and you see if there are any liens. Has anyone done a phase one? Was there a loan done on this? Re and the way you can find out if there's been a phase one environmental thing done was you go to the title company and you see if there's a new loan recorded. And then you see, you know, in that title report, there will be a phase one. And you say, oh, there's been a phase one. I have to pay for that. That's great. You know. And you read the phase one, it says, there's a bunch of tanks here. <laughs> it's, it's, and we, we're going to make this loan anyway, but it's for a very small number. Um, so the, uh, whether it's contamination, clouds on the title, uh, there is no survey. Um, you know, the, your list of, uh, when it says direct construction costs, that's going to be, you know, uh, 400 line items in a construction budget. You know, that one line. It says indirect, that could be 200. One of them would be survey. No, survey from a real guy, you know. Uh, title insurance, you know, uh, interest rates, you know, interest carry. Um, contingency. The, we're not showing a line in it for contingency on this because we're trying to reduce the number of lines so you see how things interact. Do not go out and buy real estate and, and get loans with this, you know, do not try this at home. Go learn more. Uh, but this is supposed to be the introduction to this is how the pieces work together. If the, if the idea of a contingency is you are making a subjective call about how much risk in the aggregate is smeared all over this thing. On the back of the envelope, if I would pay this much for the land, this much in soft, if I could pay, you know, eight bucks a foot for the land, I know I can typically make it work in this market with the rents and the construction costs I know I got and my operations of getting it to happen. So $8 is a good starting point. So write that down, you start doing all this stuff, you get to the end, and just because it's on the back of the envelope, you put a 30% contingency on the thing. And you say, hmm, at a 30% contingency, this is a pretty thin deal. I now feel very motivated to figure out all the risks and benefits that might be in this thing. Because I think I could find that stuff out. This is not that complicated a site. I think I, by the time we actually uh, commission a, you know, uh, drawings from the architect and the survey, I want to have that contingency down to 20%. You know, I want to, so you're subjectively sort of scaring yourself because someone else will be doing it for you later. Someone say, I don't think that's enough contingency. Oh, if you go out before, you know, before lunch, before you go home, you can, you know, you could, you could come to a quick analysis on, you know, this is worth spending. What you're looking at is, is this worth spending my time on? Because as a developer, your resources are your time, attention, your own working capital, and that stuff comes at a pretty high premium. You know, you need to get paid for that. And one of the ways you pay yourself for that is you don't chase bad deals. So you want a good early screen and a good, you know, I can do it in, in an afternoon because I have a sense of what I'm looking for and what's out there. That, what's the arbitrage? What's the spread between what could be on the ground and what is on the ground? A friend of mine calls this process the search for the red flag, um, which sounds like a negative way to put it, but you're, you're looking for um, something that is going to say, go no further.
Liz actually one time told me, well, we are in the business of wishful thinking, and um, that goes for all of us. So we need to um, sometimes put on a very pessimistic hat and, and look for reasons to say no, not because you want to say no, but because you want to make sure that when you say yes, um, you're not going to get bit in the rear by something that you just um, disregarded. Well, another way to think about this is, and, and I'll bet you can do this on a very intuitive basis. This is. This is kind of a counting exercise. How many fatal flaws does a project need? One. It needs zero fatal flaws. So what's your likelihood of finding something that looks like a fatal flaw on the back of an envelope? You won't find it at all if you don't look for it. So the idea is you're doing the exercise, on, and, and you can't kind of keep all this stuff in your head. First you have to say, okay, what are the basics? And then you think, okay, what could go wrong? You know, is it kind of a, the, the, the steps you go through? You check your mirrors, you check your gauges, you're keeping an eye on the road. You're doing kind of that all simultaneously, but you start with, optimistically, how could this work? Should I spend any time on it? Uh, let me take a breath. Now let me go find the red flags. Oh, there are three or four of them here if the following things are true. So you make a little list of the following things that might be true that would kill the project. And some of them are time-related. It's too early for this project to come online. The sewer won't be here for six years. You know. The best developers we see is one, they, they look a lot, they, they just you know, hack a lot. You know, no, 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 no. They don't pursue anything that's not, you know, there's nothing out of the way. The second thing that we really like developers do that's just hard, just hard, and that's, that's called over that. You know, um, you, you get The music swells. Well, and there are the the, um, the consequence of, of being the average intelligence developer is that you're now the former developer. The, the, the thing to understand is that when you go to the bank and you want to borrow money, um, even if you have not that much, you know, equity in your house, the consequence of borrowing money to build, you know, a piece of speculative real estate is that they would like to take your house and squeeze whatever the equity they can out of it, you know, uh, as a consequence of you not succeeding. The, the Well, when you consider the actual job of the developer, that you're going to go and take these disparate pieces, and out of chaos you will make order, just like God. You know, so it's kind of appealing. You know, so, and you know, but you know, God doesn't have to worry about the bank taking his house. Um, and the 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 genetic flaw that allows you to proceed and have, keep a straight face with your spouse. And say, no, honey, they want you to sign this personal guarantee, too. It's just routine. <laughs> and you sleep with this woman for four more years before the ugly truth comes to visit your home. The, the people who can do that, it's, it's, they're like, in some ways, they're like sociopaths. There's like bad, bad brain chemistry, bad wiring. You go to the next town. And they create new unpredictability. The, um, if you uh, were, we're in a joint venture in, in uh, 
in Texas right now in, in El Paso, which is a really swell form-based code. Smart code, incentives, TIF deals for people to work under the smart code and the like. Um, and so far, so good. I'm, I'm impressed with the staff. They seem to know what they're doing. The developers we're working with are, are being cautious. It's like all, I'm not seeing a lot of red flags, but a few of them. Uh, one of the red flags in that circumstance is if the charrette produced such a gauzy image of utopia that you can't measure to it. On your best day, you delivered 95% utopia. You bastard, you, where's our 5%? You know, where's that, you know. So some of the ways that the utopia thing trickles down into unpredictability is that after all the images were created and after people have started to do bad math based on the new form-based code, they've now, even though there's still some entitlement to do, they've backed into what their land residual ought to be on what could be built on a maximum basis on their parcel. And, you know, it's great that in 20 years that might be a five-story building, but in today's market it's going to be two. But they want to sell it as if it were five. So it doesn't sell. Or you have some people that speculate and think it's going to sell, and you have some transactions that reflect the, the future value that nobody gets to harvest because the expectation was set too high uh, in the in the charrette, in the in the comp plan, and, and some of these other things as an upzoning takes place. Built with flexibility. The problem is that that's great if you already own the land. You know, if everyone's been excited about how great it's going to be, uh, and now it's doing bad math. Uh, in their pricing to sell the land, you know, the, uh, you don't have that much room in a deal. So the, and if someone wants all of your room and, and more just to sell you the land, then you can't, and on the back of the envelope, you'll see you can't do it. So the, uh, one of the things, the, we uh, bought some land at appraised value as part of a uh, private public partnership with the city. The city says that it, you know, they have to sell it at appraised value, otherwise we trigger all kinds of consequences. Um, the project manager for the city, who is a very nice man with 15 years' experience in the planning department, um, is so excited about this project that from the place that it had 500 police calls a year, he takes the appraiser to our completed project that's in a, it's wonderful and it's great and it's very high value in another town. And the appraiser says, well, if a fellow was to, you know, actually have that neighborhood transplanted here where there were 500 police calls a year, the value of this property, fully entitled and fully, you know, would be, you know, amazing. So we got to overpay for the property based on what we were intending to build after we got the entitlement. We, it wasn't even entitled yet. But once that appraisal is in place, well, the only way to get it undone is to get another appraisal. And if they differ, you know, wildly and the like, then you did a tiebreaker. And now there's three appraisals sitting in the file and, you know, and the deal is no further along. So there was not a lack of good intent from the project manager from the city, but, you know, there was going to be a form-based code. It was going to be revitalization of the neighborhood. It was going to be just like the project in Chico. And the value got pushed to the land in a way that wasn't appropriate and it was actually easier just to overpay for the land than to fight it. So there are lots of things that happen when we, things are actually going our way that are the red flag that Frank was talking about. Bruce? Kind of a, a question point. Um, confirm whether this is right or not. Um, I used to work, like I said, for the Cell DC, and we had all kinds of storefront program for rehab and uh, tax credits and all that sort of thing. And it always seemed like it really didn't help because you're giving out a pot of money, but you're expecting so much in return that it constrains the developer. My question is sort of, um, can you tell me what kinds of incentives yeah. actually do work? Mm -hmm. And are, I mean, it, it just seemed like all these tax credits and storefront hmm. this and that and the other thing were just The, well, on a good day, they're a wash. Um, on a bad day, they're actually, they drives things in the wrong direction. Um, often what you'll see happen in a, in a private tax credit deal that doesn't have a nonprofit involved 
the, the city is going to have to contribute, you know, the land. And uh, a tax credit application gets put together and processed, and then you come up half a point, sh you know, short. And now the city has to reroute some buses to get the score up. And now the city, the, the number of things the municipality has to do to somehow advance that joint effort in the scoring system, uh, it can end up being very expensive. And good tax credit operators know that, you know, they shouldn't put much of their own money in because really the risk is the city's. Because the scoring system is sufficiently tough that if you can just hang on, the city will dump some more money in it. You know, and if they don't dump any more money in it, then you walk away because you can't dump any more money in it and make the money. So uh, a lot of the incentive programs that are available, um, if the strings are attached to, you know, big lead weights, don't advance the project. You know, if there's some minor clerical stuff you need to do, you know, that you, you weigh those things. And you say cost of compliance, I'm estimating at $20,000 to deal with the fact that I'm taking a sewer extension grant from the city, uh, which requires that I do the following. And I think that the, uh, one of the problems that also happens uh, is that uh, if you train as a housing person in the public sector, um, if you have a waiting list of, say, 2,000 people that want, want to be first-time homeowners, that's a big accomplishment, right? And you've kept really good, you know where all these people are, you have their current email and phone numbers and everything else. And so the developer comes in and uh, asks you how many of these are people who have actually qualified for a mortgage. And you said, oh, qualified for a mortgage. Yes, that, that would be an important thing. Uh, uh, none of them, actually. We haven't asked. So, so I think that the uh, recognizing that people in the, pu in the public sector have a lot to do just to get things to the point where you can enter into a, you know, a deal with a developer. And uh, it takes a lot to, to kind of translate between those two groups. And there's a lot of red flags and fatal flaws that exist in bad translation, you know, in bad communication. That could turn into a no. Well, I think the happy medium is that you want the right players in your band, and you don't actually have a formal contract with each other. You're just kind of working it out. So if you can find a developer that you can communicate effectively with, and then you find out the things that you didn't communicate effectively with, and you solve them together, you know, and you're doing it quickly, as opposed to you're going to do it rigorously. You know, um, the, it's better to be roughly right than precisely wrong in a long, long period. You know. So if you can give somebody a quick no, developers have a thick skin. They'll, they'll come back and ask again for something else. You know, they have lots of envelopes they can write on the back of, you know. It, it's brutal. Particularly if you get a slow no after, you kind of got a teasy yes. And then you got a phone call from a city councilman who said, you know, we're really excited that you're going to work on that corner. So the, um, and also there, there's not enough common vocabulary between a developer and folks working administratively or electeds and appointeds. So we're not even sure we're talking about the same project until, you know, it's become painful for the developer to be there. And then their communication skills suffer because they're feeling, feeling a lot of pain in their hind parts. 
and they're thinking that, you know, they're seeing red flags pop up, you know, and they're recognizing that I'm going to have to, this is going to be held over for another meeting. Oh, my God. You know. um, I'm the official den mother of this session and the developer, so please let me know. The, um, and for folks who want copies of the presentation or spreadsheets that didn't get it or whatever, you know, come on up and take a card or give me yours or whatever, and we'll get that worked out. And um, I want to I answer, answer someone's question earlier about cost, um, direct cost, sources for finding direct cost. John had mentioned um, using local, local contractors as a great resource. Um, there's Marshall and Swift, which is a, a big national um, subscription-based, again, service, but you can actually go in there and buy you know, individual property reports uh, for just about any building type, uh, any class of property, and it's geographical uh, location. So you can get your direct cost estimates. They, they update them, I think it's every month now. Um, you can get really up-to-date direct cost information. It's Marshall and Swift, and there's another one called RS Means. RS. It's RS, yeah. They, they publish the books and the uh, subscription program for. Those are, they're, they can be wildly off and yeah. they can be amazingly accurate. It's kind of a crapshoot based on what well, data based, they're getting. Yeah, the data they're getting and that fluctuates. So. so if you're in a market that doesn't have a lot of construction activity, it spikes around. If you're in a major market, it's fairly stable. So you want to you look at it through a time series then if, you, if, you're, if you're using their data yeah, try and use it so, as a time source. So one of the things you can do is if you're in a minor market, uh, a satellite or a tertiary market, and you know that your prices are always a little under Boston's, you know, that you can, know, you can typically build for $10 a foot less than they can in Boston. Use the Boston numbers and wait till you talk, get bids and the like. But, but come up with a, a, find a way that make a connection between where you are if it's a small place and a big place that has a better data set. Um, and stay away from the books that are that you can pick up at, at Barnes and Noble, because by the time that stuff's yeah. published, it's it's all over the page. But it's carried out That's to three so decimal places, so it looks really accurate. So be careful of that. So thanks very much for your attention. With all your patience on the front end of this. Thanks.